for me, progress is when we really have an equal society. Uh, I think that's when I'll feel like we have now reached a stage where I'll feel comfortable. Um, so for me, progress is about, you know, creating spaces where we can see more inclusion of people with disabilities. Hi, and welcome to the University of Pretoria's Lead the podcast. I'm the host, Lennox Vasara. So great to have you join us in our company at this present moment. I've actually get the opportunity to speak to trailblazers, our alumni from the University of Pretoria, who some of which actually continue to contribute to the body of knowledge, as some of them become academics at the University of Pretoria, which is truly exciting. Today I have the opportunity to speak to Professor Shaquille Adara, who is the director of the Center for Augmentative and Alternative Communication, typically known as AAC Systems, they basically use that to help people who are unable to communicate to speak and to tell their stories. She hails from Limpopo and has spoken fondly about how her roots and her family has aided her to be successful in her field. And most importantly, she graduated at Tux with both a master's and PhD. And her PhD and also her research work has opened doors for her to be able to collaborate on separate projects with the likes of Leeds University in the UK, Roehampton, uh, also in London, amongst many other collaborators such as UNICEF. I'm thrilled today to get to speak to her and to find out more about her journey. Prof, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So the first thing anyone is thinking, the first thing I was thinking is what actually is augmentative alternative communication? So AAC, augmentative and alternative communication, is really different methods, means and strategies to communicate. Um, so we're dealing with people who have limited speech, really severe communication disorders. So many of them are unable to use speech to communicate or get a message across. Some might have difficulties even understanding language. So what this is, is really a collection of different strategies and systems to help a person to communicate. It can be a permanent system, so somebody could rely on the AEC system forever, for life, or it can be for a temporary or a short piece of uh, period of time. So if we think about during the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of people in ICU with tracheostomies, etc. So those people would benefit from um, augmentative and alternative communication for that period of time. And then once they were well again, they could go back to using speech. On the other hand, we have children, for example, or, um, people who have had a stroke, who are unable to communicate as a result of some neurological impact, and they would then use AEC for the rest of their lives. So it's really a variety of different strategies that we use. Some of it is, as we were chatting earlier, using your body to communicate. So gestures, nat natural gestures, elements of sign language as well could be used as one of the systems, or otherwise what we call aided augmentative, uh, augmentative and alternative communication. And that's something that's outside of your body. Mm. So for example, on an iPad, you could load AC software, and that can be used to communicate. Uh, some, you know, there's kind of a lot of an, uh, a large explosion around the mobile technologies, which have made AC much more accessible. But then there are also specific devices that have been developed specifically and only used for communication purposes. Um, and of course, we kind of uh, rely on using both of those. We try to use some of the high technology systems, but also we like to use unaided systems and low technology systems. For example, using a communication board, which is just simply a board with different pictures right. or some words or letters. Um, and what we try to do really is get somebody to communicate. We don't really care how they communicate, we're more interested in making sure that they are able to communicate and what strategies can we harness for them to get their message across. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the uh, broad overview of it. Yeah, yeah, I was just speaking about that. I remember in school, I used a lot of like images to remember certain things. Yes. So it's one way to remember stuff and to like, I'm glad it's working in that way. But you also spoke about how the aided AAC uh, also is something that's beneficial. Have you seen, what, like, what's the big difference when you implement it? Like, is there like an 80% difference in how they communicate? Like, I don't know if you're able to track it like that. I think it's difficult to kind of track in a quantitative way. Uh, we tend to focus also on, you know, uh, 
there are studies that have shown, uh, you know, there's an improvement in terms of the number of interactions. So one of the most, I think, um, impactful things that happen when you are unable to communicate is you become more socially isolated, right. more lonely. And by having, um, you know, access to AC, you are able to communicate much more frequently. So you'll have much more interactions, more people talking to you and you responding to. So the opportunities to engage are more, the opportunities to learn are more if you're a young child. So, you know, and uh, I think there's also like a hesitancy sometimes in our field uh, where people say, oh, if we give you these systems, you're going to stop talking. So mm. often parents are very afraid and they think, if I give my child access to this ASC system, they're going to become lazy or they're going to just rely on it and not speak. But we have kind of an evidence um, or a body of literature that's actually showing it improves your ability to speak. So it's almost like when you take the pressure away from having to speak when it's so difficult for you to do so and so laborious, then actually uh, you provide an alternative system, then there's kind of more speech over the years. So the benefits have been documented in the literature, um, particularly around improving speech. And of course, there's you know an increasing body showing that it also improves the way you comprehend language. You spoke a bit about COVID-19, uh, that being quite a helpful aid in, in the time. Having seen all of that, you know, what is, how is this actually helping uh, the people that you're assisting actually participate in society, mm -hmm. contribute to, to society? So I think that one of the important things when we look at children in particular is that their access to education becomes much more improved. So they can participate in classrooms now rather than sitting at the back of the class and nobody knows what they want to say or, or kind of also they kind of dependent on somebody else to interpret a gesture, for example, oh, yeah. when they have an AAC system that can speak. Uh, and has a voice output, as we say, then they kind of become more engaged in the classroom and they can learn much better. So I think in terms of giving people more opportunities for learning, more opportunities to interact in itself has, you know, uh, an improvement. We also know that, uh, you know, we run or we used to run um, a program called FOFA, <laughs> which comes oh, from okay. uh, like to fly, right? So we run a program with young adults who use AEC and we kind of improve their communication competence, which means the ability to use the AEC system. And what we've seen as a result of that is that some of them have actually been able to be employed, have been able to uh, apply to a college or varsity college wow. to do some kind of a, a diploma. So what we see is that as people's communication skills improve, they're better able to participate in society. And that's all the things that we do, right? The leisure, access to education, access to employment, um, and just generally our quality of life because we are more connected to each other through our communication. I was, I'm also thinking about curriculum development as well. Is it uh, curated in a certain way for, that would assist them as well? Or uh, what are, is the customization and how yes. uh, you know, academics go about it? Uh, well, so I think if I can talk about within the schooling setting, for example, um, a lot of the kind of goals that they set for a child together with other therapists, etc., are very much related to communication and participation in the classroom, how to assess a child, for example. So you've got to make some of these accommodations or adaptations. And I think the same would apply when that particular individual is, um, you know, attending school. But if you are attending a university, for example, but if you have somebody who's not participating in class, yeah. who's not contributing, it's really difficult to understand if the person understood what is their knowledge like, etc. So I think those systems really give people access to communication. But through those systems, obviously, they can be assessed. Uh, you know, the knowledge can be, you can in some way assess what their knowledge gains have been in a course, for example. You've worked in many communities in South Africa. You've worked with children with autism. You've also worked with many adults with disabilities. What has this shown you about what they actually need and what they actually want? Because I guess there's a bit of a gap sometimes. Right. Um, so I think the one thing we realize is that everybody wants to be connected. Yeah, true. We all want to make meaning with each other. We all want to feel like we are contributing to society, right? And I think that's something that comes out over and over 
people who have severe communication disabilities also want to be contributing members of society. And um, that is something I think we underestimate uh, in people. We also know that people want to communicate. People want a better life for themselves. They want to have access to the same opportunities as others have. And I think that is, you know, what people want and what people need. What people also would like, I would think, is a more inclusive society. So a society that's less judgmental, that would allow people to have access to education, access to health care, um, and not to be on the margins of society, to be really truly included um, and have a voice in matters that relate to them. I think that's fundamentally what what um, comes out through our research. Interesting. And, uh, you, you know, one thinks about we are so connected because we have our phones and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, we feel a little disconnected uh, right. to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that uh, already we have the digital divide where a lot of the people, some of these communities don't have access to um, what we have typically? The aided AAC, is mm -hmm. it difficult to get into these communities or you, know, you have to find funding to get it there? Is it affordable for them as well? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the issue of affordability and accessibility are huge in this country. Um, what we have seen in recent years is that there is definitely an increase in terms of access simply because devices have become much more affordable. Right. So by using mobile technologies or a cell phone, for example, we're able to have more people have access to AEC. But I think there's a large proportion of people who are still marginalized Access to electricity, we underestimate. Uh, we think about it a bit maybe now about load shedding, but for a vast majority of people, access to electricity to charge your device, for example, can be a huge challenge. So those are things we really need to consider. Um, in terms of, I think, what government has tried to do is actually make sure that young children can have access to AEC via, like, you know, a tender system and you can procure a device, etc. But I think we're a long way in terms of making it a much more equal society and ensuring that, you know, all people who require AEC have access to it, whether it's low technology or high technology. Um, I think in, in all ways, we have like a dearth in terms of people's access. And the nice thing about your journey is that you've been in the higher education space for, for a long yes. time and you've seen it evolve. One can assume that institutions of higher learning have been transforming over the years and more transformed today as compared to the 90s and the 2000s. But you joined uh, the University of Pretoria early in the 2000s and in particular, I think it was 2000, that you joined and worked in various capacities, uh, especially doing research and also as a scholar. And then later on, you joined as a member of staff in 2014 and presently you're still working at the department. And what are your personal reflections and learnings about transformation, having lived and worked at the university in different capacities uh, over the years and seeing it evolve and transform? So I've learned that transformation is possible. All right. <laughs> it can That's, a good, thing. That's yes. a good thing. It does happen. It can happen. But it's a, something that takes time, I think. So if I think when I started here as a student in 2000 and then working here, it was a very different place at the University of Pretoria. So I do think we've come a long way. I think it's much more inclusive um, in terms of just, um, you know, the the demographics of the university, the teaching staff, etc. So I think we've had really some made some great strides. I think there still remain some aspects of the university that are still quite steeped in its institutional culture that we maybe still need to address. But I can say that it's been positive to see how we've kind of transformed over time and how we still remain committed to transforming because I don't think it's a destination. I think it's something that's constantly one has to strive for um, as we keep looking at our own limitations in understanding people and others, as we say. And one also thinks, I mean, and right now I'm thinking off the top of my head that, you know, sometimes people expect these things happen so quickly, these transformations. Do you feel that they happen fast enough? Or I think they are pockets where it's fast and they right. are pockets where it's very slow. That's what I think uh, is, is the map I've seen. So, I mean, we work in different faculties, yeah. with different colleagues, and you can see, uh, you know, some faculties transform faster than others um, and some just take a little bit longer. So I do think it also is dependent on like the leaders and who are the leaders 
um, that makes a huge impact. Yeah, but what I think was exciting is that it's becoming more accessible for many young people to get into university. Yes. I think NASFAS had a lot of like applications, record numbers in the yes. last while. So that's a, a good sign, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, which then brings me to thinking about your family who played a great role in supporting you to um, you know, nurture your academic interests. And obviously there are many contributors in your journey, but if I may single out somebody which is uh, your mother, yes. what did her support look like? Well, my mother, um, she uh, was a very interesting woman. Yeah. Uh, she, um, so she, you know, being from the North, if I can say, uh, you know, uh, was really denied a lot of uh, access to education. So I think for her, it was sort of um, when there were opportunities, she really encouraged me to take them. Um, you know, so some of it was around like policy at the time and where we went to school and which universities we were allowed to go to, et cetera. So, you know, within those limitations, she would still encourage, like, you can leave home, you go in, do what you need to do. And then also coming from a fairly um, small community, when you leave home, you know, there's a lot of discussion around whether that's a good thing or not. And my mother would serve as a buffer, right. uh, you know, and say, I'll handle what people have to say, you go ahead and do what you need to do. So I think in that way, you know, she really felt that as a young female, it's really important that I have an education, that I be independent um, to a large degree. And for her, that was really kind of, you know, uh, gaining access for, for things that and opportunities that she may have been denied for, for me to have those opportunities. So I think, you know, in that way, she was quite visionary. And I would say my dad, too, because yeah. he also kind of encouraged that. And, and I think back to my little school <laughs> in Nirvana. Uh, and, um, you know, a large proportion of those students landed up being quite successful. So I think there was a value for education, you know, for people to go out and improve their lives and get a good education and contribute back to society. So I think as a collective that society is actually very nurturing. I think there's a lot of good out there and we don't always hear about it. You know, Absolutely. we hear about the Vassori, so to speak. Uh, and that's I think your mom's like many other supporters out there who are championing for young people to, to get into education. And it's still sad that some parts of the world, you know, you can't actually, you know, the people cannot have access to education and there's that level of discrimination, which is truly unfortunate. Absolutely. Um, and it's still there when we look at people with disabilities. Yes. It's, I think that's for me quite the tragedy in the whole situation is that still access to education, and I mean quality education, uh, is also problematic. And I think that's something that I continue to kind of be involved in that space because I do think it's one of the most equalizing things we can do in a society is when we give everybody access to, yes. to quality education. True. And also, I think from a structural point of view, from facilities within schools as well, yes. that they need to be... Um, they need to be, uh, you know, quite friendly to those who have limitations as well. And I haven't seen a lot of that in, in many other schools. I think only now institutions are starting to sort of like get the hang of that. Yes. And I mean, there is a movement even to include, for example, children with severe to profound intellectual disability in schools. And I think what we want to see is more involvement in community and to have people more visible with, with their disabilities and not kind of you know, um, not given these opportunities simply because we make assumptions about people's capacity. That's true. And I am keen to find out as well, because this season we're focusing a lot on growth and progress. And uh, from your perspective, what does that actually look like for you personally? For me, progress, well, growth is obviously a mindset for me. We, you know, to be open to learning and to being open to learning from everyone, because I do believe we learn from whomever we meet. So that's really important. And for me, progress is when we really have an equal society. Uh, I think that's when I'll feel like we have now reached a stage where I'll feel comfortable. Um, so for me, progress is about, you know, creating spaces where we can see more inclusion of people with disabilities, but just generally inclusion of marginalized people. Um, the more we're able to do that and create an inclusive society, the better we are as a nation or as a country or as people. Yeah. And do you speak about that? What role do you think we have, uh, somebody listening right now, uh, thinking what 
small steps can they take to make, to, you know, to, to create the war that you just described now? Mm. Want to kind of reflect on something I read not so long ago. Yeah. It was written by Rumi. Um, so, and he talks about, you know, um, listening before we speak. So it's something along those lines. And I just think that as a society, if we spent more time listening to each other, listening to each other's stories um, and trying to understand each other better, I think we'd be in a better place. So I think as a society to not be afraid to reach out to people, to give uh, somebody an opportunity um, and to just be more open to to what others have to offer, I think we'd have a much better society. Um, and I think, you know, um, for many people, uh, I have a colleague who works at the center who also has a disability, and just the kind of biases we sometimes have towards what people are able to contribute to society. Yeah. I think if we had spent a little bit of time reflecting on that and what our own biases are, where are we at and where, where can we get better in terms of how we treat others, how we see others um, is really important. Um, it might be a bit soft, but I do think there's a lot of talking and a lot less listening these days. And that's something we need to do a lot more of, just listening to each other and each other's stories. Yeah, there's a lot of listening to respond, I find. But talking about, I mean, you've had a lot of time to see how these uh, you know, interventions you've come up with change people's lives in the sense that they're able to communicate. Because perhaps sometimes people take advantage of them because they're not able to communicate, but now they can communicate, now they have a voice. Yes. Uh, have you seen them holding institutions accountable that are uh, serving their needs and their wants? I think we are seeing a little bit more um, people trying to hold people accountable, I think. Um, you know, and I think that is something, like we spoke about, progress and transformation, those are things that don't happen overnight. So I think being able to communicate is one thing, but then also being able to have that sense of self-efficacy uh, yeah. about, you know, I can make a difference in my life. I can, you know, uh, hold um, accountable people who teach me, people who um, function in my life. Um, those are things that we see, but maybe not nearly as much as one would think one would see. And I think it's about keeping that space also open for people to speak for themselves. So sometimes I do think, why am I speaking on behalf of people with disabilities True. when I myself don't have one? Um, so, you know, we try quite actively to ensure that we create those spaces in our research in the way we publish, for example, that we kind of have those voices there and um, not just as a token, but really in a meaningful contributory way as well. Because I think there is knowledge that they share that sometimes we're not, um, we wouldn't have had those insights if we didn't have that kind of collaboration with people. So I think to the short answer is that um, I think we still have a way to go in terms of accountability or holding others accountable. But I think we, you know, we remain hopeful that that, that those impacts will happen over time. So my final question to you is you've had the opportunity to well, walk around campus when the jacarandas uh, were all purple and you know, the roads painted in purple and um, when the seasons do change. One as a, you know, as a student, as a scholar, and then one now as a, as a member of staff and a researcher and also a professor. Um, how has UP helped you in your journey to progress and to be successful? So I think um, UP has had over the years very visionary leaders. And I think like if I think my entrance into UP was through a very visionary person, the co-founder of the Center for AAC. So I think that's been really important. Uh, but over the years also, I think, you know, UP is really good at providing good mentorship. So I remember joining back in 2014 and being part of a mentorship program where I was allocated to a professor outside of my department who served as a mentor and guided me in kind of navigating the space. It's also very good in supporting young and emerging researchers. So there's a lot of support that's provided to you if that's what your academic interest is and if, you, if that's the path you want to take. So I think it's been extremely supportive. It's been 
really kind of um, a very nurturing environment and a very intellectually stimulating environment as well. So lots of exposure to international researchers, international travel um, and exchange. And those, I think, are really important in in refining one as a as a young academic. Wonderful. Well, uh, Prof, we appreciate your time and wish you the very best with all the work that you're doing. I know that you are busy. You've got eight PhD students <laughs> presently. Yes. Um, uh, so hopefully uh, all that does, uh, you know, turn out to be as great as you imagine it to. And also uh, just a thought that your the AAC system you're using, that perhaps one of those might be one of your PhD students <laughs> in the future. Is that something that you would possibly see like somebody coming all the way with the PhD from having struggled in high school and then to perhaps the well, highest qualification maybe we, be a PhD. We've, we've had one success story in South Africa, uh, wow. Martin Pistorius, who actually started off with um, the, uh, what we ran then was a diploma and went on to do his uh, honours in AEC and now works in uh, the UK uh, in some software company. So, I mean, we've had some some good success stories, but those are the outliers. We want more of them. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Thank you so much. Uh, more outliers indeed yeah. that we'll hopefully get from this program, but you can certainly tell that there's a lot of great work that's being done by Prof. Shakila's department uh, here at the University of Pretoria. I learned so much about having to understand and being able to listen, and most importantly, that you and I have a part to play in creating a better society. That brings us to the end of this episode. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Remember that you can rate and review the podcast and also uh, find us on YouTube as well if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you might be finding your podcast. But if you do require more information on the podcast, simply visit up.ac.za forward slash lead up. And uh, this season we're releasing the last Monday of every month. So you can expect the new release then. But this Production is probably brought to you by the University of Pretoria's Alumni Relations Office. Our production team does include uh, Samantha Castle, Alna Schutz, and of course the wonderful audio and visuals you're getting right now coming through from Maropa Communications. Till we meet again, it's nothing but love and light. Take care.